Welcome everybody. Just give it a minute or so to allow people to join, but we'll be get, getting going very soon. So I think we should get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the first uh, round table of the Health Devolution Commission for 2023. It's very good to see you all with us. Uh, and we're incredibly fortunate today to have three great speakers. We're massively uh, uh, grateful to uh, Patricia Hewitt uh, in particular for being willing to uh, come and talk to us before her report is published, which is due to be published at the end of next week. But I would be very grateful because she's given us uh, that uh, sort of generosity of, of being with us, that you treat it as confidential until her report is published next year, next week. Um, uh, uh, that would be really appreciated. Uh, but we're also delighted to have with us uh, to speak to us, Dave Finch and Zena Etheridge in the second half of the session uh, this afternoon. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and contributions uh, from commissioners, from uh, parliamentarians from both houses and uh, from others who are attending uh, this afternoon. And um, you can uh, you feel free to uh, offer your thoughts also uh, through uh, the chat function. Just by way of my own sort of very brief personal reflections, uh, I chair, I should have said, I, my, I'm Norman Lamb, former parliamentary, former member of parliament of North, North Norfolk, but now the chair of the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, but a joint chair uh, of the Health Devolution Commission. And I should say an enormous welcome to Imelda Redmond, who's joining as a co-chair together with me and Andy Burnham. And also a welcome to Anna DeRoy, apologies if I've got the pronunciation wrong, uh, a new commissioner who's the chief executive of BACP. So a uh, big welcome to both of you as well. But in terms of my reflections on the early days of the ICS uh, architecture, um, inevitably with a new reform, uh, there's going to be very variable practice around the country. Some ICSs, I think, have moved faster than others. Uh, some are more uh, uh, willing to exploit, in the best possible sense of the word, the opportunities that the reforms uh, provide for us. I think in particular about the opportunity for a much closer relationship between uh, the NHS and local government, uh, and a much greater focus on local population health than simply the delivery of local health services. Uh, and I think that's a key feature of the Health Devolution Commission's vision uh, that we need to focus much more on population health and uh, what we can do collaborating with the providers of other local services to move the dial on how we prevent ill health, uh, prevent deterioration of health, rather than waiting passively for uh, ill health to hit us as a system, uh, which is the traditional approach perhaps, but the wrong approach uh, in an age when uh, so many people are living with chronic conditions uh, and so many people are living with preventable illness, uh, if only the system was better at intervening earlier to support, to, to prevent deterioration of health. So that's just so initial thoughts. I, in terms of my own ICS in South East London, uh, I have to say I've been impressed by the leadership there, their willingness to uh, collaborate very closely with local government, their willingness to identify some big issues. Uh, from my point of view, one in particular that I'm interested in, children and young people's mental health, but identify big issues which require a system response, a system solution to a dysfunctional uh, current situation. Uh, and I think that's where the ICSs can really come into their own, uh, bringing to the party 
uh, the uh, various parts, constituent parts of the NHS, together with local government, third sector and community. Those, that's the opportunity uh, that we've got. Um, I should also say that there was a very exciting uh, gain for us and our agenda in the budget. Um, more uh, devolution of responsibility and power to Greater Manchester uh, and to the West Midlands combined authority. And I think that sort of endorsement from the Treasury of uh, the potential power of these uh, more locally uh, provided solutions, I think I find very exciting. And I think it's exactly the direction uh, that we should be going in. Uh, I've said enough. Um, I should reference the excellent background paper that's been produced by our secretariat. Um, and I should also uh, now introduce to you Phil Hope, former care minister, uh, one of my predecessors in the role that I had, and a commissioner, um, uh, as well as a key member of the Secretariat to highlight some of the other major policy developments uh, that uh, uh, we're interested in uh, on this commission. Over to you, Phil. Uh, thanks, Norman. And I know people want to uh, hear from Patricia, so I'll be very, uh, very brief. Just to echo your point about the budget, it was sort of bad news, good news. It was uh, the bad news about the, uh, the, the halving of the money for care that was announced previously. And I know that that's a question that being debated in the Lords uh, today. But as you say, um, deepening the Greater Manchester Health and uh, Social Care Integration Strategy and widening the West Midlands to include a duty uh, to promote and improve population health are two major significant strides forward for which I think we can take some credit in trying to uh, lay out the ground for why that's the right thing to be doing. I uh, just wanted to highlight in the paper that people have had um, a couple of other policy developments. It's a, always a, a fast moving landscape is health and social care. Um, the government have announced uh, the major condition strategy, which they're going to put a combined strategy together on what they see as the major drivers of population and health, which includes cancer, um, cardiovascular, coronary chronic respiratory diseases, dementia, mental health and uh, MSK. Now, all, all I would say about that is that's not a bad thing to be doing. My anxiety is that the individual strategies that we were expecting for each of those conditions, Absolutely. which included social care and the wider population work, we don't want to see any of that lost if it's being put together into one strategy. Um, the NAO, the National Audit Office, uh, did a review of mental health services, which I think we would very much support the analysis that they made about the dilemmas. And as you know, uh, Norman, we've made a, a big thing in the, in the Commission about parity of esteem between mental health and physical health, as well as social care and the NHS, as well as the wider public sector dimension of improving uh, population health. So that's definitely worth a, a look, and I hope the government does listen to its recommendations. Um, there's been a, a new policy on children with special educational needs uh, and disabilities, a new SEND and uh, alternative providers plan, which I think is significant. We've talked a lot about how ICSs have now taken on the mantle of leadership of children and young people's health, uh, which we weren't expecting. I think this is another dimension to that, particularly for children with uh, learning disabilities um, and whether they're getting the right kind of health care they need. And, quite what the role of ICS is in that, I think, is really important. And then just a couple of other points. Um, they, there's been a, a publication of the fair costs of care analysis for anyone in the social care side of things. Um, the, uh, the difference that's come out of the analysis across all the local authorities uh, between what a local authority pays and what it costs, something in £200 a week on average for different people, different in different, different regions, uh, tells us why the care system is struggling so much because there's just not enough money in in the system to pay a fair cost of care uh, when it comes to it. I'll pause there because we're now going to move into the debate, but I can see that Kiara uh, uh, has got her hand up, uh, Norman, so I'll stop there. Kiara? Hi, Phil. Hi, Norman. Hi, Kiara. It's Kiara from NCAP. How are you? Hi, um, good. good. I just wanted to ask, please, in this meeting, could, please, could we all try to speak as accessibly as possible? Um, not just for me, but for everybody. So if we could try to be accessible, if you do have to use a hard word or term, please, can you try and explain it? I would really appreciate it. So just ringing the accessibility bell. <laughs> absolutely brilliant, Kiara. And thank you very much for that uh, reminder. You're absolutely right. Uh, now it gives me an enormous pleasure to introduce 
Patricia Hewitt uh, from my own county of Norfolk these days, uh, but uh, lead for the Hewitt Review. Uh, I don't want to take any more time, so over to you, Patricia. Norman, thank you very much indeed. It is such a pleasure for me to be here. And Chiara, thank you very much indeed for calling that out. Um, I will absolutely do my best. I uh, get driven up the wall on occasions by <laughs> particularly NHS jargon. And absolutely. I'm still coming across um, new, you know, don't abbreviations worry. that I don't begin to understand. So I will do my best. Don't worry. Um, and also, it's lovely to meet you, Patricia. I've seen you on the news and in oh. politics, and I recognise your face. So thank you. Yara, thank you. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm I'm not as bad as people made me out to be. No, <laughs> no, I, I, because as soon as I saw your name on the list, I was like, I've seen her on the news. I I recognise her. So yeah, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. It's lovely to meet you, and it's lovely to be here with Norman. Uh, former colleague in uh, in Norfolk and Waveney, um, with Phil, former colleague in the House of Commons, Stephen Dorrell, whom I've worked with, of course, on health in many different ways. Lovely to see that we have in the virtual room um, Duncan Baker, who's been such an ally in the Norfolk and Waveney integrated care system, um, particularly around mental health and other aspects of uh, integrated care and many, many other colleagues. I, I won't try and name check everybody. Um, and thank you also for just uh, respecting the fact that the report will be published at the end of next week. And therefore, what I'm saying really is confidential at the moment, and particularly for journalists, I think, with us uh, under embargo. But I was so pleased um, by the work of the Devolution Commission, because like you, Norman, and all your colleagues, I believed back in the day when I was in government and since, we are far too centralized as a country. And although I'm not going to go into that in the review, it's part of the background. And in one of your latest um, documents, I think you, you practically open with the statement, integration is the only way forward. And that is exactly right. And my review will make that argument as strongly as I can. But before we come, I've got some slides just to um, sort of make it easier for people, you know, to take people through the highlights. I do just want to say, this has turned out to be an even bigger, much bigger, task than I thought it would be. And I'm very conscious of the weight of expectations upon this review. And given that those expectations and the views I've been hearing um, don't always coincide, there are different emphases, there are outright disagreements. So I'm bound to disappoint some expectations, but the general thrust of what I have heard from all the partners in and around integrated care systems, the voluntary community, faith and social enterprise sector, local government in its many different roles and forms, social care providers, who of course between them employ more people than the NHS itself, obviously the NHS, and that's many different organizations as well. The weight of what I've heard all goes in the same direction, and that's what I will be, I hope, reflecting as powerfully as I can in my report and my recommendations. So, uh, Laura, uh, could, could we have the slides, please? I think that would be helpful for everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Assume everyone can see those. Let's go to the we can. slide. Wonderful. So that's just a quick overview of this very rapid process. Ideally, we'd have had longer, but frankly, we need to get on with it. So I'm not aiming for perfection here. I'm aiming to land important changes that we need to make. But 
uh, hundreds and hundreds indeed, thousands ultimately involved in this discussion and uh, in the work. So next slide, please, Laura. Now, these six principles are really important because interestingly, this is what emerged in the first round of conversations, over 300 people, really up to about Christmas. And we distilled them into this. And they represent really the, the bedrock of the review. They're absolutely critical to success for integrated care systems. But they're also, I think, a touchstone, along with other aspects of the review, that we can come back to, to say, hang on a second, is that particular proposal consistent with this? Um, so in the next couple of slides, I will say a bit more about, I think, all of those, but we can come back to things that I miss in questions. Next slide, please. So the case for integration at the outset, or the case for integrated care systems, but I hadn't expected uh, when I, to my great surprise, was asked to do this review, I hadn't expected to need over again to make the case for integration and integrated care systems. But it's become very clear that actually we do need to keep on doing that. We need to show the successes that this way of working is already representing. Um, but there is less understanding than I'd expected of what integrated care systems are really about and the partnerships that they are about, rather than simply being the NHS with a few add-ons. Um, so really important that this is not seen and not allowed to become just another re NHS reorganization. It's a huge opportunity and we have to seize it. And then the other point I really want to call out here is if you've seen one ICS, you've seen one integrated care system. The words of the wonderful Chris Ham, who's been a great uh, ally and contributor to this review. And they vary hugely. The smallest one's about half a million, one county, um, one system, one place. And then you've got, you know, the biggest system around three million people with 13, if I remember correctly, um, unitary or upper tier health authority, um, uh, local councils within it, and the same number, of course, of health and well-being boards. So massive variation here and also great variation in the effectiveness of partnership working, how strong the relationships are, how mature they are. Next slide, please, Laura. So I really want to highlight this, this first point because the four core purposes of integrated care systems, which is what makes all of us who believe in integrated care systems so committed to them, look at what they are. The very first one, improving health outcomes as well as health care. So population health management. And the second one, tackling health inequalities. And then thirdly, using the resources we have within Norfolk and Waverley, within Greater Manchester, within Gloucester, wherever, the resources we have, particularly those at the NHS and local government in financial terms, but much more, well, even more importantly, the huge assets we have within and around our communities in the voluntary, the VC, SFE sector in particular. So the collaboration that we're building locally around those big goals doesn't yet exist nationally. And that's why there'll be a strong recommendation for cross-government working on prevention, 
population health and health inequalities. But the second point I just want to stress, I think when this review started, the sort of way it was seen, and, and maybe even the way I was at least partly seeing it, was fine, we've got integrated care systems, we need to get on with doing our really important work, but we need various national bodies to change the way they work in order to support us. And what became very clear early on was actually all of us have to change in order to make integrated care systems a success. And that includes change within integrated care systems. So for instance, not surprisingly, because they are so new, we're still getting some of the old, very long established behaviors between NHS trusts and the NHS Integrated Care Board, which is a, an important part, but not the whole of the integrated care system. And those, those changes, those new relationships, the principle of subsidiarity within systems, as well as between systems and national organizations, that's work in progress. And we all have to live that and make it real and build effective partnerships rather than sitting on the sidelines and saying, well, what have they ever done? Or I'll wait and see. Um, so you can read the, the rest of this around, perhaps just if I may, I'll highlight this emphasis on outcomes. So really focusing on the state of people's health, the individual, the wider community, the population, not simply the treatment. And of course, we know, and your commission's called this out often, our own health and well-being depends on a great deal more than simply the NHS, vital though the NHS is. So next slide, please. Um, now, What's been emerging in all, almost all these discussions is the huge importance of culture, behaviors, collaborative leadership. And from that has come this ambition that as integrated care systems, small or large, we should be aiming to become self-improving systems. So we pull in support and we have to get the right support. We're honest about what we're doing well, what we're not doing so well, get the right support and keep on learning, building our partnerships, making steps forward and then going further and faster. But to do that, as we say in the principles, we need time and space to do that. And, um, uh, there are a number of sort of supporting recommendations around that, including the relationship between the integrated care board, which is the bit of the system that's accountable for NHS performance and money across the whole system between the integrated care board and the regions of NHS England, but also critically trying to get much more consistency, alignment, and understanding at the national level between the NHS and local government and other key sectors in order to get budgets and finances working as effectively together as possible. I don't have to tell people on this in this meeting how many barriers there are in the way of making uh, this real. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. I'm not that's seeing a slide. Is that my that, machine? That, that's the end, Patricia. <laughs> that's the end. Right. Goodness. And I was just getting, thank you, Laura. I would completely <laughs> lost track of how many slides we'd ended up with. Let me make, um, let me just make a final point, if I may. <clears throat> Over many, many years, 
so many of us, probably most of us, all of us in this room, have talked about and believed in the need for this new way of working and this big shift to supporting people in their communities and supporting communities to be as resilient and well as possible. But we've never really achieved it. And, you know, people are entitled to say, and I've been asking, how do we make it different this time? And there are other reasons, but one of the reasons I want to call out why I think it can be different this time is the very unusual degree of cross-party support for integrated care systems and this way of working. Um, it is very interesting. Of course, there are differences between the political parties, quite rightly, and there always will be. We're in a democracy, thank goodness. But there is also real commitment, I think, from government ministers, from the opposition, from the Liberal Democrats, and of course, from many, many people of no politics at all. Mm -hmm. And it is inherent in an integrated care system that you work with all your partners around the common purpose that we all have of improving population health, people's health, and improving services and the other purposes I talked about. And so I think that collaborative working, which this commission itself represents, we get that within integrated care systems in a way that almost by definition isn't always reflected in parliament itself. But because of that degree of cross-party consensus and the wider support for integrated care systems, and this same approach is being developed in many, many parts of the world for exactly the same reasons. Norman, you summarized them beautifully. We need the time to make this happen instead of just you know, having yet another reorganization in another year or two. And I really believe that we can get and we must have the stability and the backing for integrated care systems over a five, 10, and actually when we're talking about children and young people, 20 year horizon. I was going to talk about children and young people and I thought I had it on a slide, but I can come back to that in a moment. So, um... Patricia, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, a really clear uh, description of your key priorities. Um, now, if it's okay with you, Patricia, we can open this up for questions now. And um, I think we've got about 20 minutes in our schedule. And what I propose to do is to take um, commissioners first, uh, then parliamentarians. I, I've, I've had a message to say that there's a vote going on in, in the House of Commons, so that might be affecting uh, MPs ability to be here at the moment. Uh, and then we'll open it up to others. So to start with commissioners, uh, let's um, start with Rukshana. Uh, and then Stephen, uh, and then um, Alison uh, is the first tranche, and then I'll come back uh, to others. But can you keep your questions succinct? And if, if we have all of the questions in each batch, Patricia, and you can respond to them all together. So in that order, Rukshana. Thank you very much, um, Patricia. I'm Rukshana Kaplan, and I'm the and I would love to hear more about what you were going to say about children and young people. Beautifully succinct, thank you. Uh, Stephen, next. Uh, thank you, Norman. I'll try and be equally brief. I'd like, I was struck by what you said, Patricia, that although everybody talks about the importance of integration, actually it's talk very often and it's very often skin deep. 
And for me, one of the key elements of that is the relationship between all these services we're talking about and elected local government. And I use the word local government, not local authorities. And I'd be interested to hear your view of the role of elected local officials, local councillors, and the, the local government structure in shaping the decision making of ICS. Thank you. And Alison. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, it's really great to hear you committed to ensuring this is just not a report that sits on the shelf that is actually implemented. So my question is, um, have you had any inf what can you tell us about any sort of informal undertakings you've had from government to when they, they will publicly respond to your recommendations and what the timelines might be for them to implement this? Patricia, you're muted. I know. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself just to avoid you know, um, feedback. Great questions. So first of all, Rokshana, thank you very much both for your work and your question. Interestingly, a lot of people were asking me to recommend, as I think somebody said earlier, that ICSs should take the lead in children and young people's health. I'm going to do something slightly different because what I know from Norfolk and Waveney, but we're not unique, is that in some systems, actually the director of children's services and the um, partners within the NHS and partners within the voluntary and community sector have themselves taken the lead, starting certainly in our case before COVID, to create a really powerful alliance for children and young people based around the, the core um, duties, if you like, and expectations of the Children Act of 2004. So I had assumed, because that's happening within the um, within Norfolk and Waveney already. And we are wiring that into the integrated care system, but we're not replicating it. I'd assume that was happening everywhere, but it isn't. It's happening in some places. So what, I'm, what I will say roughly in, in the um, report is that because of the need to invest in prevention and make it real, this work with children and young people, starting obviously before the birth, but then going right through, especially in those critical early years, central to the four core purposes of the integrated care system. And therefore every integrated care system should be um, creating or building on a children and young people's alliance. And that is one of the things that the CQC should explicitly be looking at when they start to assess systems, because they will have a very important new role under the Act from last year in assessing systems as well as um, different bits of service provision within systems. So I hope that will be a powerful and helpful recommendation. Stephen, on your really important role about elected councillors and local government. So integrated care partnerships are, if you like, the they are the convening body of the entire integrated care system. And crucially, they include elected councillors. And indeed, in many cases, it's an elected councillor who chairs them. Um, it varies in, in Norfolk and Waveney. I chair the, the NHS Integrated Care Board. I'm the deputy chair of the Integrated Care Partnership. Uh, one of our most senior local councillors, who's also the chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board, he chairs the Integrated Care Partnership, but is on my board as a partner member. And there are variations of that all around the country. So that's one way. Second way, of course, is the Health and Wellbeing Board itself, and that's crucial in the larger systems where you have multiple 
health and well-being boards. But their work, led by local councillors, directly feeds in to the integrated care strategy for the whole system, developed through and agreed by all partners in the integrated care partnership. And then the third element is the, see if I can get the name right, but the health overview and scrutiny committee. Um, now again, really important. Um, and what, what's emerging from the, the discussions I've been having with elected councillors and others about local accountability and how we strengthen it, um, is the idea that actually the, the overview and scrutiny committees should have explicitly a role to scrutinize systems and system working. And in the large integrated care systems that have got lots of these overview committees, you would have a joint one to do that piece of system work. So, and then Alison, final point. Um, no, I don't yet know the, um, I think it's fair to say that health ministers have one or two things on their plate. Um, indeed, that's true of government as a whole. So I don't know what the timeline will be for their response, but many of the recommendations I'm making are up to us. They're up to NHS England. They're up to CQC. Um, and in some cases, if government either just doesn't get round to it or doesn't agree with a recommendation, I think there are many ways in which we can collectively make it happen. And the support that I've been getting from the, the local government association, thank you, and from the CONFED and other national bodies, there are ways in which we can pursue this work, even if government itself doesn't quite do everything we want as quickly as we would like. Brilliant. Thank you, Patricia, for those answers. I'm going to take all the other commissioners who've got their hands up, um, and you can perhaps just respond to uh, all of them as best we can within the time scale. Um, got yes, available. sorry. <laughs> uh, can you hear me OK? I can. Hello. Yes. Okay. So, uh, first of all, just a written question from Jackie O'Sullivan from MenCab. How can mm -hmm. we ensure that we keep an eye on the integration prize given current crises and pressures? And also, do you have any, uh, it says hacks, but I think it should be ideas for changing culture and mindset quickly. It can take years for that to embed fully, very much endorse that sentiment. Uh, and then can I bring in first, and can you all please be really concise in your questions? Linda, Steve, uh, Kiara, and Naomi. Yeah. Hi, um, uh, Linda, I'm one of the commissioners, and I'm also a chair of uh, uh, an NHS trust in Bradford, so part of the West yes. Yorkshire yes. integrated care system, which you'll know well. Um, and it was really to follow on from the written question, which is, I think all the ICBs are facing a big projected deficit for next year. The local authorities are only making their balanced budget because they're dipping into reserves. Mm -hmm. So we're facing a future of the ICSs with huge budgetary difficulties. And I think that's when people begin to revert to old behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just whether there's any way through that um, as we face really choppy financial waters. Brilliant, thank you. Steve? Hi, thanks Patricia, that was really good. Uh, I heard a lot of what I, I really liked actually in, in what you said about integration, particularly the need to um, get this right and the need for the, the voluntary and community sector to be at the table and delivering as equal partners, I think came through very good. My big concern with that, particularly with cost of living, is that those relationships are more critical than ever. And it's how, I suppose, although I agree that we need time to get this right, how do we move some of that forward much quicker, given where we are now? And certainly from my sector, which is 
mental health that I represent counsellors and psychotherapists. How can we plug them into the system better? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Nice and succinct. Chiara? Um, hi, Patricia. Um, my question is, people with a learning disability die on average 20 years younger than the general public. Who is responsible for changing that? Who should our Treat Me Well campaigners speak to about what is being done locally to fix this? Thank you. Brilliant question. Uh, Naomi. Uh, thanks, Patricia. And brilliant as always. It really, I mean, it really is an amazing piece of work. Just very quickly, on integration, I am used to a system where everyone has a think bubble about what it means. I'd like you to tell me what it means, because I'm nervous that those think bubbles are all different. I just want to know, <laughs> what's the definition? What do we mean by integration? And just very quickly, um, Amina, you've got your hand up. Um, at the moment, I'm just taking commissioners, but I've uh, logged that you've got your hand up. Keep it up, and I'll make sure that as soon as we come open it up, we get to you. Back to you, Patricia. Right. Help. Um, <laughs> me... Sorry. No, no, it's fine. Let me start, Chiara, with your question, um, because it is a disgrace that people with learning disabilities die on average 20 years younger. I was outraged about that when I was the secretary of the Minister for Health in government. I set up an inquiry, a wonderful group of people to call it out. We started to make a difference, but I think more recently, there's been much more awareness of this issue. And I'm seeing more and more um, systems, but more and more parts of the NHS really becoming aware of this and trying to change the way they work, how they respond to people with learning disabilities, making sure just as a start that you all get a proper physical health check to make sure you know that your physical health needs aren't being ignored just because everybody's thinking about your learning disability. So I think there is progress. And I would hope within what I think is a very strong um, forum of national voluntary organizations that the Department of Health and Social Care brings together, you, MENCAP, other organizations concerned with learning disability would really feel you have a voice and will be heard. Naomi, I think you're, I wish I had a really simple answer and I don't. I suppose I've got two. One is the four core purposes. A second one, which I do find helpful as well, is that integration operates for an individual joining up all the different sources of support for health and well-being including treatment but not limited to it around the individual and where it's appropriate their carer their wider family so integration for the individual integration around ah oh, care pathway in the jargon, but people, um, for instance, with type two diabetes or at risk of it. And of course that takes us into a whole wider debate about obesity. So integration around a particular condition group of people, more and more of us, as we know. And then thirdly, integration around the whole population or particular communities, um, particularly focusing on those with the lowest life expectancy, the greatest social and economic disadvantage. So it's probably, God, we haven't got much time, have we? Okay, um, let me come back to Jackie's great question about quick hacks for culture change, I wish, but um, 
I think the most important thing, things, begin, really begin to identify your common purpose, you know, and it may be as we're all here to support and serve our residents and support people to lead longer, healthier, happier lives. So if that's the common purpose, where can we start, especially for a less mature system? Let's start by quick agreement around the kind of behaviors, or as quick as possible, the kind of behaviors we want. And although they were developed for the NHS, the new operating framework of NHS England has a really great um, portrayal of behaviors and values which look very familiar to me in terms of what integrated care systems themselves are saying about their behaviors and values, and then do something. Because even, you know, if the partnership's new and fragile, just find enough agreement between you that, okay, here's a problem, it's really important, and we want to solve it. Putting in a really effective falls service so that elderly people are let older people are less likely to fall but if they do they don't wait hours for an ambulance um whatever it is do it and build the culture and the behaviors in the doing <clears throat> learn from it replicate go bigger do more um and linda lovely to see you and west yorkshire is such a great system um yeah the finances are a nightmare um, and integrated care systems in their new statutory law basis. Um, you know, we've been born at a difficult time. And I, I'm afraid, well, the only way we can respond to that is by leaning into it, taking as much agency as we can and using it as an opportunity for change because we're not going to be able to cope with the current finances <clears throat> the current financial framework simply by you know salami slices taking x percent off everything and just expecting everything will still be done but only by fewer people with less money not going to work so we really need to look at what are the things that we can do together? Does the integrated care board and the relevant local councils, can they, for instance, have a single, small example, but communications team that's doing the work around health and well-being? Local councils, in my experience, are often much, much better than the NHS at really engaging with the public. So let's use that expertise instead of trying to replicate it somewhere else in the system. And, 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 and let's remember that it was austerity and the slashing of local government budgets that led Wigan to the Wigan deal. So you don't have to replicate it, lift and shift very rarely works, but that's the spirit. And Steve, on your point, um, we need to use within every system all the resources, both of skilled professionals, but also of other people, health coaches, life coaches. There are, there are many, many ways of supporting people to be, to enjoy better uh, well being. And they don't all include psychiatrists, the most expensive resource. Many of them, if you like, come much closer to individuals, much closer to care in the community, much closer to prevention. I'm not saying that very elegantly, but I hope it conveys the general gist. Thank you, Patricia. Um, now, we're very tight on time, but it's important that I invite parliamentarians Please. to offer uh, thoughts uh, for you to respond to. Um, and I will also bring in Amina at this point. Um, so I could see 
Claire. Claire Tyler, very good to see you. Or perhaps <laughs> I should say Baroness Tyler, I apologise. Th 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 thanks, Norman. And th thanks, Patricia. Uh, I'm in the Lords. Um, I also sit on an NHS Foundation Trust uh, overseeing oh. a group of hospitals in London. And it just happens I've literally come hot foot from a four hour board meeting where we spent the, really the entire time wondering how to deal with the budget deficit. Um, loads of things we want to do, you know, to integrate, to collaborate. Um, but I think my, and it's building on what Linda asked you really, what needs to be done practically in terms of how and when budgets are allocated to get the sort of budgetary alignment that would allow the sorts of things that you're talking about? Because I'm just concerned, if you like, the hard wiring isn't really there at the moment. And I suppose as a related point, I wondered what your view was and whether there will be any recommendation in relation to a move towards pooled budgets between health and social care and, and also whether there will be anything about uh, social, the social care workforce and the sort of parity uh, with NHS. I don't see any other parliamentarians hands up so I'm going to bring in Amina at this point and if anyone else wants to make a really quick comment then show your hand now and I'll try and bring you in but we're very close to the end of Patricia's time. Amina. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, just to say I'm a tra trainee psychiatrist. I'm going to currently work one day a week in Parliament. I've got two quick questions if you don't mind. Um, Patricia you mentioned that no two IT ICSs are, are the same and that there could be huge variations between them. How do we then ensure that the parity of care delivered, there, there is parity of care in delivering between the two systems, between various, I mean, different systems. And the other question is, how will ser services who currently provide care in prisons, both NHS and private, how will they be integrated into the ICSs? Now, I don't see any other hands up, so over to you, Patricia. Thank you very much. And Claire, lovely to see you. And forgive me, because I actually don't know which um, FT you're, you're on. And in any case, I wouldn't dream of commenting on individual systems, because by definition, I only know, you know my own in any detail. But um, if you take an overview of what's happened in recent years, and this is not a comfortable observation for anyone in the NHS or more widely. There has been very significant additional spending. There has been a very significant increase in parts of the workforce, doctors most of all, A&E doctors, I'm pretty sure the highest increase in number the productivity of our acute hospitals has gone way down. And of course, some of that was inevitable during COVID for very obvious reasons. And there is still, COVID has not gone away and infection prevention control measures and all the rest of it haven't gone away. Nonetheless, I am very struck by the fact that the Northwest London system um, which is one of the few, I think, it's probably the most advanced in terms of its real understanding of productivity within the system, particularly within the NHS. Um, they are very clear about where the drop in productivity is, what they need to do about it. And quite honestly, if they tackle those things in collaboration, with their acute partners and many other parts of the system, they don't have a financial problem and they will achieve better quality and safety and care. In, you can look at a different example up in Enfield, the largest primary care practice in the country. Again, change the model of care. I mean, I won't go into the detail, you'll see it in the report and delivering much better outcomes, care, you know, care, access, same day appointments, all the rest of it, keeping people out of hospital and doing it all pretty much within their existing budgets and their own capital. So 
I think we've got to lean into this and we've got to use and and we need to, more support in this. I'll mention it in the review. There are productivity, you know, modeling tools and things. There are uh, there's masses of stuff. Sorry, I'm not going to try and deal with it now, but more of the same won't cut it. Um, and this may be a very rude thing to be saying to you, Claire, after a four hour wrestle with a financial problem. But it is that kind of conversation. And um, why, you know, it, it's up to IC, each ICS to work out exactly how they do hard, hardwire the relationship between the provider collaborative or foundation trusts or whatever the particular structure is, increasingly a provider collaborative and the integrated care board and all the other partners within the system. But there are successful ways of doing it. Norman, pooled budgets, I do say a bit about that, but I was it was quite interesting what came back that you know, several people said you can spend years agreeing to pool budgets. Actually, you can get the benefit without necessarily doing all the pooling. So it's a bit more nuanced than I'd expected. Social care workforce, including pay. I will certainly have strong things to say about that. Um, but ultimately, we need a conversation as a society about what we are willing to pay for the care of the most vulnerable yeah. in our community, including ourselves. I'm yeah. 74. My, you know, my father was nearly 103 when he died. As we get older and frail, many, if not all of us, will need care. Yeah. And it's got to be paid for, whether it's yeah. taxes, private contributions, whatever it is. So that's not something we're going to solve in the short term, but I will have some recommendations on it. Amina, I'm not going to deal with your prisons point. It's it's too complex, I'm afraid, for, for this no time. But on parity of care, I think we need to be very clear about the clinical standards, particularly around quality, um, quality and safety. Those are national standards set by the appropriate regulatory bodies, in some cases by NICE and so on. And if you're practicing, in your case, as a psychiatrist, those standards are part of the framework of clinical governance. But it is inherent in the creation of integrated care systems that different partnerships will respond to different needs. They will have different needs within their population. Um, and the important thing is to focus on the outcomes. So supporting people's mental health as early and effectively as possible, including from conception and birth, and then through those childhood years, but also for adults, intervening early and quickly when there's either an acute crisis or signs of deterioration, and then ensuring the joining up between the specialist services and the continuing support in the community. And how you design that and the local assets you have to build on, they'll look different in different places. Um, and we, we shouldn't be ashamed of that because the attempt to impose one size fits all, particularly driven through the NHS with top-down management, is part of what is making it so difficult for ICSs to succeed. I must go. Yeah. I, due yeah. to Patricia, start that's, someone else. <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant, Patricia. My Perhaps fault. just as you go, let's just hear a 30-second comment from Nadra. Um, uh, you, you, no time for you to respond. Uh, but just, uh, Nadra, have your say in 30 seconds, if you can. I will try. I'll do that. Um, hi, Patricia. It's Nadra. Um, and I've had plenty of time to speak to you, so yes. I'll prolong this. Great. I just wanted to get this um, message across about let's not forget that social care being around the table. So nothing about us without us is really key. We must get that in and, and hopefully your report will reflect that. It's in. Yep.
Thank you. Brilliant point, very succinctly made. So thank you very much uh, for that. And thank you, Patricia. Uh, absolutely fantastic to have you with us. We really appreciate you being willing to talk to us before you publish your report. Uh, and do get off if you need to. Thank you, Norman. And I'm really sorry not to hear Zena, who's been a great colleague on all this, but enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, so now we get on to ICSs and the cost of living uh, pressures. And I, it's a great pleasure to introduce David Finch, formerly of the Resolution Foundation, an organisation that does brilliant analysis uh, the whole time, uh, and now at the Health uh, Foundation. Uh, he will provide an overview of the cost of living pressures on both the public and providers of health and social care. So 10 minutes for you, David, and over to you. Thank you, and um, as I say, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I am predominantly focusing on the, the kind of implications on the individuals, but there are clearly um, pressures on public services from, particularly from the spending review settlement being set um, when inflation was expected to be a lot lower than it has been, um, which has obviously led to some kind of extra cost pressures on, um, on services. Um, but and clearly some of the impact on individuals itself, itself leads to, um, to additional pressures on services who have to deal with those issues. Um, I'll just share some slides with you. Um, Hopefully those have come through. I think that's you can see. Um, and I'll also just start by saying that, that um, for those of you, if you're not familiar with the Health Foundation, we're an um, independent charity and we have, I suppose, two, a core aim of improving health and reducing health inequalities. Um, my part of the foundation is particularly focused on how the wider determinants of health um, impact on our health and, and cause health inequalities rather than um, the healthcare perspective, and that's why the cost of living crisis is something that's um, been we felt to be very important. Um, I was going to give a quick overview of how um, money and resources influence our health, and then run through some findings from um, some polling work, so there's some survey work, it's a representative survey of the UK um, that we funded, um, actually from the Resolution Foundation to um, to run and and provide analysis of for us to help identify how um, the cost of living crisis was affecting people's health in particular. And then I was going to conclude with a few broad thoughts about how this is relating to, um, to ICSs. Um, so it was just to, to start with, and, and these are this is quite graph heavy, so I will try and explain these and, and to make sure that hopefully they're quite simple to, to follow. Um, and this chart is really just showing how there is a very strong relationship between the income that people have and their health um, the, the little dots each represent a local authority um, within England, and they um, and the, they sort of are ranked by the level of life, the healthy life expectancy within a local area, and also the, the income of those areas. And so, what we can see is there's a really strong relationship where places with a higher average income tend to have um, better health as well on average. Um, and there's also a kind of regional patterning to that where places more in the north of England tend to be um, towards the bottom end of that scale and places in the south tend to be more towards the top with healthier and higher income. And I suppose it's also just worth reflecting that obviously um, there's a two-way relationship here where income is very important um, in supporting people's good health, but um, having poor health can also influence the, um, the amount of income that you have and also some of those wider costs that you may have to you may experience. Um, and of course, the, the cost of living crisis is less an effect on income, but an effect on how many, how much you can afford to, how many things you can buy with the income that you have in the first place. So it's it's less, it's more, it's obviously a cost shock rather than an income shock. Um, and um, and really, the money and resources um, that we have access to can affect our health in a number of ways. Um, one of those is through the kind of the feeling of financial pressure or inadequate financial resources that can be a source of stress. Um, and I think, and also if it's prolonged for long enough, that stress itself can become, have an impact on physical health. Um, and I think it's kind of important to recognize that some of that financial pressure, this may be um, struggling to make ends meet and cover costs of bills, can affect people across the income distribution. So it's not, although some of these 
things tend to be more acute for people with lower income. This can affect people regardless of income. Um, another that's probably obvious way in which money resources affect health is just lacking the, uh, the basic resources to maintain a basic standard of living. Um, so things like having enough food to eat, having um, being able to heat your home, affording rent, um, but also um, that does include things like access to health and care services as well, where there's um, the, the ability to access those. Um, but then you, there's also an impact through relative deprivation, which I think is, although you may be able to, you may have adequate income to kind of to be surviving as such. Um, there is still a stress associated with lacking the kind of goods and services you need, um, and having a status of being able to engage in mainstream society. So that's also a, kind of, um, a risk to think about. Um, and just a, a general point here is that a lot of this has long-term implications. So um, research shows that any exposure to poverty as a child compared to no exposure is associated with, with worse health over a lifetime. Um, that's a particular issue when um, sort of projections and estimates of poverty to get the moment are that um, that's increased significantly because of the cost of living crisis. Um, and I think I'm just about to move on to some of, the, some of our polling on the impact of the cost of living crisis. Um, but what that really does show is that a lot of these things are playing out now in real time through the cost of living crisis. Um, and some of these things will be were covered in the the really good briefing that was circulated beforehand. But I think what I'm trying to really get across here is actually quite the scale of how some of these things have changed and the groups that have been affected. Um, so uh, the green bars here are showing the portion of the population in November 2022 when this polling was run, um, unable to afford some basic, some what are considered to be basic essentials. Um, and how that compares to an equivalent survey that was run um, before the before the pandemic started, um, and what you can see is just this very big increase in um, the proportion of people reporting they're unable to to afford certain things like replacing electrical goods, um, having regular savings, and I suppose importantly, too importantly for health, is switching the heating on when needed at the bottom of that bar. So you've seen this really big increase in the proportion of the population were able to do those things, and I do think it's quite um, I still find this quite shocking with the extent to which this is the case um, compared to how things were sort of, um, before the cost of living crisis, just how widespread this impact is. Um, another kind of very clear implication for health is the proportion of families um, reporting that they're going hungry. So um, the, the red bars here are showing the polling from November 2022, and the blue is 1920. Um, apologies for the changing colour, which one was slightly hard to follow. Um, and again, this is just showing this very big increase in the proportion of families in some way reporting that they're unable to, um, that they are unable to afford sufficient food. So there were different measures with the most extreme at the top um, in that people were going hungry because they, they didn't have enough money for food um, down towards the bottom, which is affecting more people um, who can't afford balanced meals um, or that they just, the food they had just couldn't last. Um, and these are all different indicators within a food insecurity measure. Um, and when you combine those together, you can get a measure of how many people are reporting different levels of what would be classed as food insecurity. Um, and I think this really, this chart, I mean, the, I know there are a lot of bars on here, but this is trying to show how this has changed and how it's affected different groups as well. Um, and so the, the chart on the left-hand side is from, his responses to these questions in 1920 and on the right hand side is um, again in November um, and I think the things here to draw out is really how food insecurity has risen so sharply and across many different um, characteristics and in particular among um, different family types there isn't if we look at those light blue bars it's just a really big increase it's slightly higher for the more of the single uh, more sick in single family struggling but it is just big for all family types. Um, it's particularly an issue for people with more children, which I think you expect to see more people to have to provide for. Um, and there's a, a bigger increase for um, ethnic minority groups compared to, 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 to the white group. And also, I suppose, as we'd expect, people receiving benefits. But I think um, one thing that does come out of this is if there are some of these characteristics do map to people who will be. Um, interacting, particularly on the benefits side here, interacting with kind of public services and different 
points at which there is contact where um, potentially you could target support or not where people need help. Um, but those were kind of almost indirect health effects. And actually the survey, the way in which we constructed it was trying to bring out some of the immediate impacts on health as well. Um, and that showed that actually there were already some really um, clear direct impacts on health through the cost of living crisis. Um, we had two measures here. One was emotional distress, um, and one was um, that people reporting their health had been negatively affected by the rising cost of living. Um, and we can see here that um, the emotional distress was a bigger factor, and that's something that plays through from those um, mechanisms that we'd expect, ways in which um, money and resources can affect health, and, um, and that this is having a bigger impact for lower income families. So the um on the, the the bars are stacked um where we have one equals poorest down to five the richest and also where people aren't in employment so particularly effectively people may be unable to increase their um their income because they're not in work and so they're, they're also having a, a big level of their income is lower in the first place um and this is also noticeable where people are falling behind on bills um so here we have on the we just focus on the right hand side of this chart it's the proportion of people reporting um whether they've lost sleep um that they're feeling constantly under strain or if they're feeling unhappy or depressed and the, the, the blue bars are people not behind on bills and the green bars are people on behind either one bill or two bills or more so you can see that there's a much higher share reporting um that they're feeling anxious and happy and depressed um whether if they are falling behind on bills and that's something that has increased um, through the cost of living crisis. So there's this very direct playing out of the types of ways in which we expect this to affect health actually happening. Um, and perhaps the most complicated chart here, and I will or just to explain, this is mapping um, how people are unable to afford their heating, maps across the people reporting um, that they're, having, they're experiencing stress caused by the rising cost of living. Um, and the the, um, if we take the social renters who are in the top right hand quadrant, and that's telling us that around almost two fifths of people um, reporting that their the rising cost of living is worse than their health, and um, about 45% are unable to afford to turn on their heating when needed if they are social renters. I think this is um, quite helpful in a way that it helps to show some of those groups who are most having the biggest impact. So, social renters, private renters, um, the, the green blocks are income quintiles so people in the, the, the bottom half of the income distribution are um, more likely to be experiencing a health impact and also being able to well, if, if not able to afford some essentials. Um, so in a way that is, I think particularly the social renting point is um, and people in the lower income brackets will be accessing um, different types of support and, and benefits, which means that potentially targets, um, it, it's an easy way to either target support or advice towards people. Um, I think the final thing I wanted to cover, and I do apologise, this chart is a bit um, busy with lots of things going on, um, and it was really just the. How, I, I think it's quite hard to think that um, you know that there won't be longer term implications from the cost of living crisis. Inflation is still high. Um, food, particularly, has been increasing. Uh, the inflation rate for food alone has been higher than the headline rates of inflation, um, and there's not expected that these costs are going to drop back down to where they were before. It's more that those cost levels will stay higher. Um, although energy bills, the energy prices have started to come down or projected to come down, they're still going to be significantly higher than before the cost of living crisis. And so there is this kind of long-term potential slow burn effect where people will be um, increasingly affected by the fact that their wages are, are not keeping up with the rising prices. Um, and debt is one of those indicators of this happening. On these bars, the, the red bits are basically showing you um, whether people have increased their debt or not. And if we look at the top line there for lowest income, we can see that it's gone for um, the number of people reporting that their debt has increased has almost, I think it's more than doubled since um, early, the early part of February 2020 when a survey was run through the pandemic. Um, so I think just some of that may be a knock-on run-on effect of the pandemic, but also the cost of living crisis on top. And we know, um, and this is my final chart, um, is we know that people in problem debt have are much more likely to reporting 
um, that their health is is less than good. So the red parts of these um, <coughs> are showing people whose health is less than good. And that's a real, I think, potentially long-term risk where um, of people falling into debt and the risk mounting um, where we're having these kind of, for a sustained period of time, we'll be having this kind of effect on people's initially mental health, um, but that may turn to um, physical health in future. So just to, um, just to conclude, I think there's some immediate health impacts among groups um, and they're particularly likely to be in contact think, already with health and wider public services um, because, of the, because of the types of support they might already be receiving and the fact um, because they have children in the household, so be through schools or um, again, health provision. Um, and also that those groups are actually particularly low income families and social renters more likely to be, have worse health in the first place. Um, I think there's a significant risk that these problems worsen in the future. So it won't just be enough to think um, inflation rates have dropped, hopefully later in this year, um, but that these things will have a sustained impact. I suppose one broader question is just the extent to which existing support that isn't existing, particularly in local areas, rather than thinking about the national support that's available. So things like the household support fund, whether it is getting to the people who need it um, and the links being made between those services. Um, so thank you for your, um, thank you for that. And I'll just stop sharing that now. Thank you very much indeed, David. And I can tell you as chair of a mental health trust that we see very clearly the link between financial difficulties and poor mental health and deteriorating mental health. And of course, all of this comes on top of COVID with all of the risk factors to our health uh, that were associated with the pandemic. So it's a tough, challenging time. Uh, so thank you. Now, great pleasure to introduce uh, Zena Etheridge, former chief executive of Haringey uh, Local Authority, now chief executive of North East London, ICS, uh, who will explain what it's like on the front line dealing with both the external uh, and the internal cost of living pressures. So, Zena, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Norman. Hello, everybody. Um, I feel I lack the star appeal of your um, your first speaker, so nobody will have seen me on the news, I hope. Um, but um, <laughs> I do nonetheless feel um, pretty enmeshed in um, the cost of living crisis in um, actually the whole of North of London. Uh, I've been in the ICS in North East London for just over a year, and I was in Haringey uh, before that. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about North East London, just briefly for context setting. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the immediate impacts from the cost of living crisis we've seen on our residents. Um, but then I want to I want to talk about some wider issues, which I think um, link the cost of living crisis with some other things that are going on. Uh, and I think start to start to explain why some of this is so challenging for us. Um, so first of all, a little bit about North East London, um, 2.1 million people, one of the fastest growing areas in the country. So over the next 20 years, we will add to that 2.1 million people, uh, an increase in population, the equivalent to the size of another London borough. So uh, huge amounts of um, growth going on. It is a massively diverse area. Um, a little over half of our residents come from black and minority ethnic backgrounds um, and is uh, also an area um, of huge deprivation, um, as well as huge amounts of assets, uh, increasingly um, cultural assets as London moves east. We seem to be welcoming a new cultural institution every week. Um, huge amounts of assets amongst our communities, our um, clinicians, our uh, local people, our voluntary and community sector and our workforce. Um, so that is a very brief snapshot of, um, of North um, East London. It covers all the things that you might traditionally expect as East London, as well as the sort of northern bits of Havering, Barking and Dagenham uh, and um, Redbridge and indeed the city. Um, there's a there's a lot going on in the cost of living crisis. Um, as uh, as the previous speaker showed, there's a, there's a lot of different layers to this. Um, so I'm just going to take some specific examples and slices through uh, some of the things that we've seen. Um, so just just starting with our workforce. Um, so all, all of those um, impacts that we've just seen 
fall on our workforce, particularly the lower part, paid parts of our workforce. So you will uh, have all seen stories about nurses using food banks. And um, of course, that is even more extreme in the care workforce where um, the rates of pay tend to be lower um, and, and all of the impacts that come with that on people's mental health and physical health um, are happening in our own workforce as well as in the rest of the population. Um, we've seen some really specific impact. Um, so we did a piece of work um, late last year to look at a couple of things in particular. So first of all, we were hearing anecdotally from our um, our doctor, our general practice general practitioners that, that people were telling them, their patients were telling them that they couldn't afford to, to collect their prescriptions where they don't have a prescription exemption certificate. Uh, and so we looked at um, the number of um, asthma inhalers that we would expect people um, to have filled their prescriptions, so have gone to the pharmacy to pick up their inhaler. Um, and we were able to break that down um, by income group, and what we found is that in the lowest um, income group, there wasn't any change in the extent to which people were collecting their prescriptions for inhalers, which we would expect to be the case because we would expect them to get those for free. Um, and in the highest groups, there also wasn't any change. We found a, a noticeable change or no statistically significant, so notable change in amongst those kind of, um, if, if we split all the income groups into 10, um, in the sort of, uh, the sort of th three to eight um, groups, we found that there was a notable reduction in, in people collecting um, their inhalers, um, which suggests to us that, that people were indeed choosing not to um, uh, spend money on um, medically important things. And um, we also looked at those people who have to have medical devices at home um, in order to protect and maintain their health, um, including some, some really electricity hungry devices and looked at some of, the, um, some of the changes in costs that people would have experienced in keeping those devices going at home and, and saw that people were you know, potentially having to spend thousands of pounds more a year um, as energy costs went up. Um, so, so those areas we've seen specific impacts, um, just to sort of talk to the human end of the previous slides about people not spending money on heating. We've seen um, people in uh, our A&E departments over the winter suffering from hypothermia. Um, and um, we know that in any cold snap, there tends to be an increase in excess deaths or deaths um, above and beyond what we would normally expect to see. Um, and I don't think we've picked through the data to have seen that yet, but I think we might expect um, this winter to have been um, worse than usual because of those combined cold snaps, but also people not feeling able to afford to turn on their heating. And um, when we talk to our clinicians, um, they really worry about particular groups and the health impacts on them of some of those really obvious cost of living issues like heating and food. So they worry particularly about pregnant women um, and um, groups with um, existing respiratory or, or breathing issues um, and uh, the kind of presentation um, of those people. And I don't, I don't think we can point to the cost of living crisis and say that's why we had such a bad winter. We know there were lots of reasons, but I think when we look at the data in retrospect, we'll see that there are definitely some um, impacts that, that come through. Um, so so those, those really um, direct impacts that come through. I think there are, um, we've just heard about some of the long-term impacts that are likely to arise from debt. Um, there are there are going to be some really significant impacts around widening, widening inequalities. Um, we can expect vulnerable groups to be impacted much more than other groups. Um, the, um, the research paper that, that was sent out in advance picks out some really helpful examples and slightly heartbreaking examples about people with learning disabilities and autism. Um, and um, typically we find children particularly affected, uh, particularly children um, living in single parent households whose incomes are particularly vulnerable. Um, uh, to, the, to the sort of changes in um, income levels. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a really important theme about housing as well. Um, and we're all more conscious than, than we were um, previously, I think, of the impacts on health of poor quality housing, particularly of damp and mould. But obviously, if people aren't able to switch on their heating, some of those things are exacerbated. Um, but we also know that 
um, housing is a huge portion of people's incomes in London in particular. Uh, and I want to come back to, to, to why some of those factors might have worsened, um, but, but certainly the local authorities that we work with in North East London are seeing a really significant impact in um, the population, uh, the proportion of their population who are homeless and in temporary accommodation. Uh, and we know that um, being in temporary accommodation or homeless is really, really bad for your health. Um, the, the, the kind of, I suppose, the thing I wanted to come back to and why I'm a little bit nervous on just focusing on the cost of living is I think one of, there are, there are two really, really important thematic issues here. The first is, and we've talked about this a little bit already, the impact of poverty. It's not just the impact of rising prices. And I think if we talk about the cost of living, it, it's too easy for some people to think about that as a temporary effect, a temporary effect of inflation. Whereas the, the really significant thing for people's health is poverty. Um, and, um, and, and that is exacerbated by the cost of living. But it's been, uh, it's been a pretty deep seam um, that sits underneath it. And I think we sort of need to get better at, at thinking and understanding and building into the work we do the impact of poverty on people's health. Um, uh, and I guess the other thing that I've been reflecting on a lot um, as a leader in public service in two different branches of public service is um, the, the story I increasingly hear or have been increasingly hearing over the last few years from all frontline workers in public services in health and care, um, actually across the piece is it is, is about increased demand. Now, of course, the, the changes in demography that we've been talking about for years are happening and are combining with some of those other things that we've already talked about, the cost of living crisis, the pandemic, et cetera, um, to, to kind of produce a particularly challenging impact. But, but that, when, when I unpick, so when you say demand is increasing, what do you mean? Do you mean numbers or what? I, I hear some of the demand is increasing in terms of numbers, but increasingly I hear, um, the problem is complexity of demand or acuity. It depends what type of professional you're talking about. Um, and I think if we think about the last um, sort of 10 to 15 years and, and all of the things that have happened, so um, sort of 2008 financial crisis, um, austerity, um, pandemic, uh, coming out of the pandemic, and then a cost of living crisis. There's a huge amount going on in there, which has had really complex impacts on people's social and economic well-being, um, and the ability. Sorry, that's my timer going on to say I've been talking for nearly ten minutes, and the ability of people to people and communities to really deal with those challenges. Um, and I think that is something we need to think about and talk about more. So, you know, as we talk about communities, can building community resilience, building individual community resilience in order to deal with some of these things, actually the ability of our households, our individuals, our families and our communities to do that has just been impacted by an awful lot of things um, and people's needs are increasingly complex and that feeds into um, an, an ever-increasing need for services. People stay longer in hospital, um, the demand in children's social care is more complex than before, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I think um, some unpicking there is required. Um, I do have some positives to talk about. There are some things we're doing to, um, to deal with the cost of living crisis locally um, and some of the things that Patricia talked about earlier, you know, the ability for us to integrate, the ability for us to really focus on and work with communities, I think um, will, will um, help us move through this. Um, but there are some really deep seated issues here as well. Zena, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks to both of you very much for your uh, contributions. And I, I found both contributions resonated completely uh, with our experiences in South East London. Um, so now we move on to questions. And again, I'm gonna to come to uh, commissioners first. Uh, if you could show your virtual hands, uh, if you're a commissioner um, and I'll then call you. And uh, when I come to the two speakers, don't both feel you have to respond to every question, um, respond to the parts of the questions that are most relevant uh, to you so that we give enough time for everyone who wants to speak uh, to contribute. At the moment, I only see two hands up. Um, that, oh, I've got a third now, that's excellent. So uh, can we start with Chiara, uh, then Jackie, and then Peter in that order? 
Okay, thank you, Norman. Um, my question is, is what are the IECSs doing to help people with a learning disability manage their finances and help them shop around for cheaper energy deals and food? Most people with a learning disability need extra support. Um, and just quickly, I just want to really show a really good example of what can be done to make a difference. Um, so I have been trying to get on my LD register at my local GP surgery because I was told I was not allowed to have an LD health check because I wasn't on the list. So I made a bit of a fuss and I made a bit of a sing song about it online. And somebody from my local NHS trust um, came and spoke to me and they have now amazingly got me on the LD register at my local GP. So that's tick. I had my first ever annual health check last week. It went really well, so tick. The only thing was the form, the preparation form for my appointment I was given was not accessible, cross. So I made the GP, I took it with me to my appointment and I told the local NHS authority, NHS trust in Surrey, they are now going to work with me to make those forms accessible and they're going to change them, so tick. Um, and basically, you know, it's because I've been able to speak up, I've now, you know, got the power to actually say, I'm lucky, I can speak up, but actually we need forms and documents to be really accessible for everybody. So it's because I spoke up that now there's gonna be a change. So, and also I was in a video about it with Jon Snow, the Jon Snow from Channel 4, not the other Jon Snow. Um, and so basically, yeah, I just wanted to show that's a really good example of how I've been able to make a difference. Well, Chiara, your persistence has paid off clearly. Uh, I guess what we should be concerned about is those people who don't have your skills, yeah. um, who can't fight to get on the list at the GP yeah. and who therefore get ignored. Uh, yeah. by the system and it's those people in particular we have to respond to more uh, effectively let's hear uh, there are three hands up now let's get all of them so um, I think it was Jackie next then Peter and I'll then bring in Naomi I've got a question for David, which was, do you have any disability data? Because I know pre-COVID, um, families with a child with a disability were 50% more likely to be in poverty. And I just wondered whether that was cutting through um, the cost of living crisis as well. I suspect it is. And Zena, I thought your example about the inhalers was really powerful. And it just made me think, how do you reach that group? Because they are also less likely to be in contact with public services. And that's tapping into a fear of mine. We're seeing fewer people with a learning disability getting social care now. And I'm really worried about that cohort who have mild, moderate needs, can get by, but are also at risk of falling through the cracks. Great questions. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Peter and then Naomi. Uh, thanks, Norman. I was really interested in Zena's reference to resilience, which is increasingly being found out to be things caused by connections and communities. Um, and actually, I think it's a really important issue about how do we prepare people for the sort of unexpected shocks that we've had in recent years, whether that's diseases, lockdowns, financial difficulties, you know, the whole range of it. And how do we prepare for that? And there's something about how does an ICS influence something as complicated uh, and, as, and as difficult in some ways as communities and connections. Thank you, Peter. And finally, Naomi at this stage. Right. Um, thanks very much. Just a comment and then, and then a technical question for David. So my comment is, I kind of understand the thing about community assets and all this, but I wish we'd start using plain language about people not having enough money. All the language of resource and income and all that, basically, 
money gives you choices and not having money means you don't have choices. And I just think in terms of plain English, somehow we always shy away from that kind of language. And I think the language is really important. Now, my technical question for David is, I was surprised that on your, I think, first or second slide, you were doing income um, after housing costs. And I thought because of the changes in housing benefit, making it much meaner, that before housing costs is actually really important now because people aren't getting the, you know, the, the changes mean that a lot more people in private rented sector, um, less support in terms of social housing, the bedroom tax, the three, you know, so I, I just surprised me because I thought now that we were doing it um, uh, before housing costs. Now we're getting called out by Kiara for not using plain English, uh, so it's a timely and important reminder for us all. Um, but I'm also, I'm actually going to bring in Anna, um, and it's an opportunity for me to check how I pronounce your surname, so I'll let you do it, Anna, and then I'll get responses from our two speakers. Thank you very much, Norman. It's Anna Daroy. Great. So, very um, delighted to be part of, of, um, of the group here today. And I think some very important um, discussions, uh, discussion topics, certainly. One of the, the things I would like to raise is, uh, and I'd like to thank both um, Zina and David for their presentations in this part of the meeting. And, and I think David's presentation in particular on the cost of living crisis, it's certainly something that we at the BACP are, are really looking at and we're about to launch a major campaign on the cost of living um, later this year. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, just general comments, we're, we're seeing actually from many of our members, around 60% of our members are actually seeing uh, a decline um, and, and clients actually cutting back on the use of therapy and helping them when genuinely they actually need a lot of that help going through the, the, this crisis. Um, I was also equally um, very interested um, to hear from Zena around the whole underlying um, poverty issue. And I think that's a much bigger issue, um, clearly, than, than, than what we're talking about um, in, in, in a cost of living. And, and it's really that's quite tragic in a way, but how do we even tackle that one, which is a much bigger subject area um, in going forward. But certainly from, from um, our point of view, it's, it's I guess, can, can we work together? Certainly, David, um, if, if you're doing things on cost of living, we're do, looking at the whole cost of living crisis. It's, it's, it's really, how do we um, uh, uh, emphasize and, um, and, and uh, influence in a much bigger way really what this means and if that means also the poverty issue if we can bring that into the equation um so much the better now Thank i'm you. i'm going to break my rule because i really have to bring in a co-chair here uh amelda redmond uh, uh put your question now and then i genuinely will come back to the two uh speakers and not take any further questions at this stage over to you amelda you're muted at the moment. Silence is golden. Uh, struggling. So Imelda, I suggest you put your question in the chat function and we can try and pick that up uh, to put to our two speakers. Uh, so in the meantime, Zena, can I come to you first and pick out the bits of those questions that are relevant to you, and then I'll come to you, David. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so, Chiara, um, brilliant work. Um, we, we, need, uh, we need advocates like you in everywhere, in every system to make sure we're, we're doing those things. I spent some time um, advocating for my cleaner to get on the Learning Disabilities Register um, at his local GPs. And, and you know, an eye of all people should know my way around the system. And it was um, really much more difficult than it should have been. Um, and I guess, um, we, one of the things that I think we can do as integrated care boards and integrated care systems is make sure that we are really building co-production um, ways of working with people with lived experience, service users, 
um, our local people into the work that we do so that we're hearing everybody's voices um, as we're developing our strategies and as we're improving and developing our services. We've got some really good examples of that in North East London, and um, particularly in mental health. We've got lots further to go, um, and I couldn't hand on heart say that I'm confident that we've got the right voices um, with um, from people with learning disabilities in our system. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you asked a specific question about what our ICS is doing. I don't know what everybody else is doing, um, but one of the things that we're doing is working through um, social prescribers, so people who work with our local primary care, to um, in, reach out to people and um, find the people who, to, to just refer to the, the next question, who we might not otherwise capture um, and make sure that they are really signposted into services um, and helped. Um, there's a bit about um, resilience in all of that. Um, and, and to Naomi's point about it, the problem is that people don't have enough money, absolutely. But it's not just money, it's access to other resources as well. It's access to the social resources and social capital, which enable people into um, uh, better paid employment, all of those other things. It's access to um, things in their local community, which, which enable them to participate um, in the community. Um, and one of the kind of most, one of the more invidious effects of the cost of living crisis, I think, is removing people's ability to be part of their community mm. where they can't afford the money to go and take part in activities that they used to um, take part in. Um, and um, so how do we kind of prepare people? How do we, we create resilience? What we're trying to do in the integrated care board, certainly in mine, is to work really closely at local level with local authorities um, and with the voluntary in the community sector to make sure that we are... Um, we, are, we understand what's happening in our communities. We understand what our communities need and then design services to support what can need rather than just assuming that we know what's health um, and other support um, uh, people need uh, there's a longer more complex argument uh, sorry answer to that for another time and then on poverty I, I just think we need to build much more clearly our understanding of poverty and its impacts into all the work that we do on health inequalities thank you very much Sina David over to you Sure, I'll, I'll try and pick up the, the technical ones, but not get too technical, I guess, is the, the balance with it. Um, I think, um, so there's the question about whether we're measuring income by before or after housing costs, which is about, are we taking, we tend to take people's um, income when you've accounted for all the taxes they pay and the benefits they receive and the earnings they're getting in the household. So that's how you get your kind of household net income. And then we also tend to take off um, well, then you can leave housing costs in, or if you believe that housing costs are, you need to think about the income you have once you paid for your housing, because that's important for the things you can afford. Um, you use the after housing cost measure. And what, as, as I would understand it, and I can share some more method if it helps, is that, that does, in doing that, it does help to capture, um, we are capturing where the amount of support the government gives people um, with those housing costs is reduced because you are effectively okay. you're accounting for that bit and then you're taking off what people have paid on top if that makes sense so as things like the support private renters gets has fallen um although it was recently restored um I, I think last year um that that is being picked up um in that measure um I think there were there were a couple of threads here about I think resilience and having money or not and I do think um and I think there are some longer and, and the point about poverty and that's the longer term context where, you know, it has been a really bad before the pandemic. It's been a really bad decade for living standards. Um, and you've also seen a series of cuts to the support um, people get through social security, um, the kind of the austerity through public services, which meant some of that underlying resilience was eroded. Some of the things that um, you, know, you need to access and get support from, particularly in local areas where the size of cuts to local authorities were kind of effectively gone. And that actually means that, although not ideal, money then does become even more important because actually some of those services you'd hope people could rely on um, either aren't there or are under real strain, so people, they're harder to access. Um, so I do think there's a kind of, there's a really important thing of thinking about that resilience and how, because that's been eroded when a shock like this comes along, um, the 
the effects are bigger than they might have otherwise have been. Um, on the disability side, there is there is disability data in this. So I can share a report that has a specific disability focus. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the kind of broad conclusions are um, as a group, um, disabled people were had as with their resilience has been eroded more if we got to the cost of living crisis, particularly through the pandemic. Um, and then some of the effects we've been talking about on being able to afford essentials, food, heating, um, they're, they're greater essentially for disabled people. Plus then you have those extra costs that they may be facing um, that Zena was talking about around accessing uh, the need to kind of access services or um, if there are, um, and you mentioned the kind of electricity costs as well of having different devices going. Um, and then my final point, it was um, just reflecting on that point around the accessibility of services. And I guess, I think I tend to have more of a social and economic policy background. And this definitely comes through strongly in things like social security as well. So it's not just healthcare services, it's just the ability to actually access a lot of services can be really hard. Um, and things like uh, universal credits are kind of example where there's quite strong evidence to show that just the process of trying to access the support you need um, actually creates um, greater mental health problems for people. And so there is, I think there is a real thing on making sure that services are the people that need help are actually able to get it um, easily and quickly, um, because otherwise it does just compound some of the existing problems that are there. Thank you, David. Now we've gone, we've got about five minutes left before we get to the sort of closing remarks. In fact, a little less than that, but I've, um, uh, Imelda has, uh, who's working from her car, I, I should stress, and has, is having IT difficulties, but she asks, how do we carve out time with all the pressures day to day and long term to tackle these massive issues of poverty? Uh, if we don't, if we don't, we don't shift the dial on health inequalities. I think that's for you, Zena. Uh, but I should also ask before you both come back, uh, are there any parliamentarians who have any questions that you want to put at this stage? Uh, whilst I'm waiting just to check, um, I'm conscious that we, I think, have Alice Wiseman uh, from, uh, of the Association of Directors of Public Health with us, and also Anne McGurran uh, from the Municipal Journal. Uh, if either of you would like to ask questions, um, please do so now. Uh, and if anyone else um, wants to put something to our two speakers, could you show your hands as well? Um, I don't see any hands up. Alice, did you want to? say anything did you want to ask anything thank, thank you and thanks for the opportunity and and i, and I guess I'm, i mean i haven't really got a question other than to say that i absolutely accept everything that david and, and Zena have spoken about and all of the discussion that's taken place and um, from an association of directors of public health perspective we're really concerned about the cost of living crisis we're really concerned about the impact that this will have on the health and well-being of our residents and uh, we've been reflecting back on the children, you know, who were born in sort of early 2000s and the fact that they've only ever um, experienced a, a time of real challenge and real adversity, starting, you know, with the banking crisis, austerity, welfare reform. You know, David spoke before about the impact of the application process for universal credit, and certainly we published some local research on that a few years ago, part of a large scale NIHR study. Um, so, I mean, I put a, a comment in the chat a while ago, which is a quote from Sir Michael Marmot, which was why, why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. And, you know, I think for me, that's something that really resonates because at times what we do is we stick plasters over people and we send them back into those situations. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, that we've got all of the solutions here, but it is that the part that links to the um, QIT review and the focus on prevention and how we ensure that um, the ICSs across the country are um, focusing on the work that they can do around prevention and not just seeing it as an add-on but seeing it as something that's integral too because I think all too often we end up with demand for really expensive services when actually you know the focus needs to be outside um, and, and an, er an earlier point. Alice, brilliant, thank you for that uh, valuable contribution. 
I've now got uh, two hands up. Uh, so I'm going to get bring in Anne McGurran uh, and Kathy Elliott. Can you keep your remarks or questions succinct? And then I'll come back to the two speakers. And if the two speakers also want to add in any concluding remarks that you have um, whilst you're speaking in this round, uh, I think that's probably the most efficient way of uh, using the time available to us. So Anne first, then Kathy. Um, thanks, Norman. Um, yes, just, just asking a question um, on behalf of Municipal Journal, Zena. I just wondered how embedded councils are in this work and um, what the response, just the general quality of their response and um, how well they're working in partnership with, with you. Thank you, Anne. And Cathy? Afternoon, everyone. I'm Cathy Elliott. I'm chair of NHS West Yorkshire. I suppose my experience so far in working with colleagues across the partnership, local authorities, NHS, voluntary and community sector is giving people practical things to do. So we've worked across two partnership meetings where we people have said, give us some really simple things to do. And I've shared in the chat box our action plan. I'd really love to hear from others as well. People are busy, but let's give leaders some really uh, straightforward things to do together. And if you do one thing, it's better than trying to work out for a long time, lots of things that you can't do or you haven't got time to do. So I just welcome hearing any other practical solutions that are taking place, Norman. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. So uh, David and then Zena. Sure, I think, um, I suppose I, I feel I, I don't have great practical suggestions to give, I suppose, less of my um, expertise there. I mean, I do think what I find, um, I mean, we talk a lot about the need for collaboration, sort of cross-sector work and um, the, the role of, of local areas in determining what's best for the local population. And I do think, you know, in, in it, for me, it's been, it's been really good to hear that that is the kind of you know, the direction people are trying to go in. I suppose it's also... The prevention focus for us is also an important thing um, and I think but it, it does run into that point of just if you're struggling to find the space to discuss how to join all this up properly then also taking the prevention focus is yet another thing um, and I, I suppose it's just a hope that there is ability perhaps by taking some small practical steps initially where you can do things that it starts to help to um, allow you to find space for those because there should be a, a longer term payoff from it um, but I don't so I'm very supportive of everything. And if there are things we can do to help, then do let us know. Um, but I think, yeah, it is. I just hope you are able to find that practical space to do it. I don't have good answers, unfortunately. David, thank you so much for being with us and for your uh, wisdom uh, and uh, fascinating uh, um, presentation earlier. Um, and can I bring in Zena now? Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, so practical, um, actually, I know it's it's really dull and it's just become the thing that everybody says there is just so much we can do with sharing data better and um, you know, the granularity of some of the data that you start getting at when you look at place community what local authorities know housing data and health data if you can find ways of putting that together you can get really targeted support to people um, and using um, data for um, really targeted population health interventions so finding people who are pre-diabetic for instance and yeah. giving them evidence-based interventions that does start to make a real difference and it's not it's not really complicated and big um, it's it's just we just need to create the structures to do that. And I think ICBs are doing that, particularly through you know, that focus on population health being in, in, in our DNA. So that'd be my practical thing. Um, how embedded are councils? My councils are brilliant. Uh, I'd like to put in a real plug for them. They're really supportive. They're really engaged. Um, we've asked um, each of our places to have a place leader um, and lots of our local authority chief executives have stepped forward to be our place leader for health and care. Um, obviously relationships differ around the, the country. Other relationships are um, widely available and um, it probably not be politic for me to um, comment on some of those. Um, uh, Anna Melda's question on how do we focus on prevention in a time of crisis? Well, um, 
at Melda's job too, because she's one of the non-execs <laughs> of the North East London Integrated Care Board. So I look forward to her answering that question as well next board meeting. Um, that is the $10 million question, isn't it? That is the big leadership question for ICBs and ICSs. Can we really prove that we can do that? Can we carve out this time and space to do that? Um, I, I guess what I observe is that is what my board wants to talk about. Um, it wants me to have kind of dealt with and others to have dealt with the operational pressures as much as possible so that that leadership time can be spent as much as possible on some of those really difficult questions about prevention, um, earlier intervention, how do we reshape the system and all of those other things. Brilliant, Zena. Thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon as well. Thank you for uh, your insight from your position on the front line, as it were. Uh, and uh, thanks for responding so well to the questions. Uh, really appreciate both of you contributing this afternoon. Uh, so we now are in the last four minutes. So I turn to Phil for your concluding remarks, Phil, and then I'll just make some closing uh, announcements myself. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Norman. I think that was a, an excellent session. A lot of takeaways there from Patricia earlier, um, things that she's referenced that I think we can look forward to seeing to, you know, in more detail when we get to uh, the report uh, next week. But um, something that we'll probably want, need to get behind as a commission if we want to promote the, the, you know, the purpose and, and outcomes that we want to see. Just on the cost of living crisis, thank you very much to the two speakers. A, a few takeaways from me. It, firstly, I think there's a lot of very practical stuff happening on the ground, and we put some of that into the briefing paper. Real examples of what people are doing around fuel poverty, food insecurity, and so on. So there are things that can be done. I think David's evidence, Dave's evidence, um, those charts, I think that should be on every uh, ICB, every ICP agenda, asking uh, what here's the evidence. Uh, the NHS, local government, love evidence. Here's the evidence of a problem. What are we doing to do about it? Because it's affecting everybody's health and well-being, and that's what we're here uh, to tackle. Um, I do think the point that was made the cost of living, uh, the crisis we've got at the moment is, is is there all the time. It's called poverty. And really, that should be a mainstream part of the ICS agenda. If we're talking about reducing health inequalities, clearly, we have to reduce income inequalities. Uh, and we can work on those issues from a health perspective through the support that people give. So this shouldn't be a, a kind of this year's problem is, uh, is cost of living and last year it was COVID. It's not like that. This is a regular and should be a mainstream part of every agenda of every provider and every commissioner of services at every level of an, an ICS. I think um, uh, Cara's point about helping people with a learning disability get onto uh, the, the register, uh, there's no doubt about it. That we, we've got resources in the system that we can reach out to people with disabilities and get them on the register. Not uh, Just relying on individuals like uh, like Chiara to, to do it for themselves is not good enough. That's the whole point of why we have a learning disability register, to give people access to the resources they need. So I don't, th I don't think that, and we debated that and discussed that in the past, uh, uh, and Norman, it's been part of the call we've made as a commission. That should just be a main street part of what goes on whether it's in a primary care network, a place-based partnership or an ICS, um, resources just need to mean reach out, get people on the register so they can access the service they, they need. And the point about money gives you choices, but money, it's not just money, it's access to other um, activities. That point about resilience, I think, has come out of the discussion this afternoon. And we've got to think more clearly about what good looks like in terms of building resilience in local communities and the role of the state at all its in its forms uh, to doing that. Um, so I think there's a lot of things to, to take away from uh, the discussion this afternoon. We'll write up a, a report about all of this and circulate it. And, and I would hope that people would use their networks to make sure that this agenda item becomes mainstream for everybody, right you know, ongoing, not, not just this year's issue to talk about. Brilliant, Phil. Uh, well, thanks to our three speakers, David, Zena and Patricia. Uh, remember, please, uh, the importance of maintaining confidentiality on Patricia's comments until her report is published. Uh, I think it's been an excellent discussion. Uh, we all know that the NHS faces an existential challenge uh, because of the pressures of COVID uh, and the legacy of COVID, followed then by this uh, cost of living crisis. 
coming on top of the poverty that Phil talks about. Uh, and I totally take on board the concerns that many people have expressed that at times of pressure, there's a real danger that people revert to the worst behaviours. I guess our message on the commission is uh, to do the opposite, to see this as a burning platform and to say that actually, if we keep doing the same thing, we'll get the same answers and we'll fail people. And it makes the case for change uh, and for recognising the importance of focusing on the health of our populations uh, and working collaboratively uh, to improve uh, that, that health, recognising the enormous inequalities of health we have across our communities. So thank you all. Uh, the uh, next meeting is in person in Manchester. Co-chair Andy Burnham will be chairing and the topic uh, to be discussed is the role of ICSs in joining up health and economic participation. It's from 3.30 to 5.30, Wednesday 21st of June at a central Manchester location to be confirmed. Uh, Steve of the Secretariat uh, will be circulating all the details and inviting you to register shortly. So on the, well, one minute past five, I've failed as a chair, I'm sorry, uh, but great to see you all. Thanks for your brilliant contributions and see you all soon. Thanks, Noah. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.